Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, also, it's always a pleasure for me to be back in Paris. So many thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so I would like to share some recent thoughts about likelihood for inference. Uh, but maybe before we dive into uh, this, uh, the statistics for the more statistically oriented people here, let me start with the big picture in cosmology and what I would like to make sense of. So this is roughly what it looks like. Here are observations on the, um, um, on the left of the cosmic microwave background, these beautiful observations from the Planck satellite with, with structure in the, in the fluctuations of this cosmic microwave background. And here on the, on the right, observations from, from galaxy surveys. So this is here the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this also shows very rich structure with this network um, of uh, sheets, uh, filaments and clusters, which we call the cosmic web. And um, so essentially the big picture is here. The universe is highly structured at all scales. And we want to make sense of this structure. So, and in particular in connection to our observations. So as we are going to learn from the third workshop, I'm sure it turns out th that this is something that we can very well simulate. So the question is, how do we make the connection uh, for these from between these um, simulations? And, and our observations. So let me start with um, a kind of thought experiment and what I would do if I would have in, um, uh, if in, in the ideal scenario. And the ideal scenario for me would be to have an infinitely powerful computer. Here it is. So uh, we'll do Bayesian forward modeling in this ideal scenario. So essentially we set up the, um, on, on our hard drive all possible initial conditions for the universe. And we are going to run them forward with the help of the simulators, third conference. So this forward model can involve a galaxy, um, an n-body simulation, and we can then refine to put our galaxies in there. So halo occupation, galaxy formation, you can have feedback of the central black hole and its environment, etc. Here it's all fine because the computer is infinitely powerful. So we are going to end up with a set of all possible final conditions for the universe. Here, here they are. And we are going to compare them with the observations. So this comparison we'll do through the full likelihood. So the full likelihood in this case lives at the level of the entire map. So that's, uh, that's typically a very high dimensional likelihood. Or we can uh, be slightly more modest and restrict ourselves to summary statistics, which can be, uh, in the simplest case, the power spectrum. But we can also have a look at higher order correlations in Fourier space or in real space, or some specific elements that I was mentioning at the beginning, so clusters or voice, etc. So this comparison uh, that we do will mean that we are going to discard some of the possible final conditions which are not compatible with the observations. And then in turn we are going to discard the corresponding initial conditions. Right. So that's the ideal scenario, the, simple, uh, the simplest picture. Now if we actually try this in practice, it looks more like this. Whatever sample we try is rejected. And the main reason why this fails, and which dramatically fails actually, is that the true likelihood lives in uh, about 10 million dimensions. And so we are essentially trying to hit a target in 10 million dimensions, which is pretty much an impossible job if we do not have a good method to do so. So one way forward is to simplify the physics. Uh, so this is an approach that I've been working on uh, during my PhD with Ben mostly and over the last few years with, with some collaborators. So we have um, uh, what I believe is a really beautiful likelihood based solution which we call Borg, uh, Bayesian optimization, uh, sorry, Bayesian origin reconstruction from galaxies. Uh, which uh, simplifies the physics uh, a little bit and also uses a much more clever uh, statistical method that the uh, simple mind pictures that I showed at the beginning and this is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So it uses this, uh, this method which allows to, to sample the posterior, actually the pretty much the only known method to sample a very high dimensional posterior. And so the, the picture of what this, uh, this looks like is essentially uh, these samples here. So you have here, this, we are, uh, any picture is one sample of the posterior PDF. You have here the reconstructed initial conditions, the corresponding final conditions, the two being linked by uh, some proxy model for gravity. And these um, fit the observation, so in this cone here, which is covered by the observations, with something that fluctuates at high redshift here, or uh, wherever it's marks, so um, out of the survey boundaries. And this quantifies the uncertainty. 
So this was uh, this was uh, in the era of big data, um, a quite a, a, an intensive computational project. We got about uh, two th uh, twelve thousand samples during this run, and this was about. 250 data model evaluations, which is roughly the order of magnitudes of what we can afford uh, from these simple simulations with the computers that we have right now. So I just wanted to advertise that if these data products are of interest of any interest to you, then they, um, the high-level data products are all publicly available, and I'm also uh, more than ready to share any lower-level data products if they would be of interest to you, it's even individual samples. Uh, just one showcase of the kind of thing that we can do from these posterior samples and this, reconstru this reconstruction of the dark matter uh, density field. Uh, we can have a look, for example, at the dynamics of, uh, of structure. So here I'm showing the radial velocity field in the equatorial plane, um, with the, the Milky Way being uh, here. And you have, so for example, this, this large structure here is the Sloan Great Wall, one of the biggest structures in, in the known universe. And you can really uh, nicely see reconstructed the inflow uh, of matter on, this, on the wall. So this red part here, which is matter um, falling on the wall, so flying away from us by falling on the wall. And this uh, blue crescent here, which is mat matter which is coming towards us. Um, right, an act of uh, shameless advertisement of my own talk. I will say much more about cosmic web analysis during my, my seminar for those of you who will still be here on, on Monday. But for the moment, uh, since my talk was uh, entitled uh, Involve the World Likelihood Free Inference, let's try and go back to the challenge. And uh, so this picture, which dramatically fails, as I was mentioning at the beginning, and we can ask ourselves, uh, all right, why does it fail in more detail? And what are, what, are what are exactly the reasons why this will not work? So the way, so as if we formalize essentially this idea, what we are trying to do here is what's known as approximate Bayesian computation in statistics. So essentially statistical inference for models where the likelihood uh, function is intractable, and that is our case because it lives in 10 million dimensions, but simulating data is possible. So with these two assumptions, the general idea is to find parameter values for which the distance between simulated data and observed data is small. So essentially, the approximation is to go from the exact posterior, which is the P of theta, whatever parameter we're interested in, conditional on the data, to an approximate posterior, which is a P of theta given a D tilde, where the D tilde are simulated data. The distance between the simulated data and the true data uh, should be small. So small by some measure, which remains to, to be defined. So in our case, the assumptions will be that only a small number of parameters are of interest, so essentially that this theta is a fairly low-dimensional vector. Uh, but the process which generates the data can be uh, very general, essentially a black box. So uh, it can be, and it will be in our case with uh, simulations of structure, a noisy, nonlinear, uh, dynamical system, and with a very large number, or even an unrestricted number, of hidden variables. So in, in our case, the hidden variables will be the individual phases of the um, simulation. So the simplest idea that I was showing on this slide to do this uh, approximate Bayesian computation is known as likelihood free rejection sampling, or sometimes actually even in the astrophysics literature it's, it's um, incorrectly known as just ABC, but I would like to make the point that a more proper denomination should be likelihood free rejection sampling, since ABC is a much more general class of methods. So the idea behind the likelihood free rejection sampling is to iterate uh, many times the, the following algorithm. So we sample, um, uh, we try a parameter theta, which we sample from a proposal distribution in the model space. So this proposal distribution is typically the prior. Uh, we run it, uh, we run forward the simulation. So we simulate uh, data, so this detailed according to the data model. We compute the distance between simulated and observed data, and we will retain the parameter theta if the distance between simulated and observed data is uh, smaller than some uh, threshold, which we set up, called epsilon. So essentially, if we fall within the sphere from the true data, then we'll keep the parameter value, and otherwise we reject it. So essentially, what we are doing is an effective likelihood approximation. We are replacing the true likelihood by an effective likelihood, which looks like this. So it's an indicator function for the distance between simulated and observed data being smaller than some epsilon. 
Right. So, um, and the oh yes, I should have mentioned that. Well, this is likely a free rejection sampling. A variant of that is when epsilon is adaptively reduced, and this is known as uh, population Monte Carlo. So I was saying at the beginning that this is basically hopeless if we deal with a very high dimensional problem. So we can ask ourselves in more detail why, um, why indeed does, it, does this fail? So why is likelihood free rejection sampling so expensive? And I can think of four possible reasons for that actually. So the first one is uh, it rejects uh, most samples when epsilon is small. So essentially when this threshold is small here, then the number of samples which will fall below the threshold is very low. Second point, it doesn't make any assumption about the shape of the effective likelihood, which is this underlying uh, functional here. Third reason, it, doesn't, it only uses a fixed proposal distribution and not all the information which is available, because once you have already run a few simulations, then you actually have more information than just what is in your prior, and you could use this uh, information to draw more efficiently your next samples. And fourth reason is that it aims at equal accuracy for regions in parameter space, whereas in this simple picture here, I would, I would argue that these regions here are more interesting to sample than these regions over there. So essentially the idea with uh, the proposed solution to go uh, beyond likelihood free rejection sampling will be to replace this effective likelihood approximation um, and to go essentially from this picture to this picture here. So the proposed solution is uh, something which has been developed in the machine learning literature over the last uh, few years. It's an algorithm which is known as BOLFI, uh, Bayesian optimization for likelihood free inference. And it essentially addresses the four questions that I was just mentioning. So uh, likelihood for rejection sampling rejects most sample when epsilon is small. So in this case, we are not going to reject any sample, but we are going to learn from all of them. Uh, we are going to model the distance, so the effective likelihood. So model the distance is assuming that the average distance is smooth. So essentially, we are going to model this, uh, this function here uh, with this um, blue line and its uncertainty. Uh, we are going to use Bayes' theorem to update the proposal of new points based not only on the prior but also on the simulations that have already been run. And finally, we want to be able to prioritize some regions in parameter space. So we do not aim at equal accuracy for all regions in parameter space, but we want to be able to, to prioritize some parameter regions uh, which, for which we already know that we have a small distance to the observed data. Right, so before telling you how we do that in practice, I just wanted to um, uh, highlight a few recent uh, related pieces of work uh, from cosmologists, uh, from cosmologists mostly in the audience actually. Uh, so mostly related to uh, data compression from approximate Bayesian computation, which, has, which is uh, an aspect which is very uh, related to this and actually very complementary to what I'm doing here. And also um, density estimation for likelihood free uh, inference. Um, so a fairly similar idea, but uh, using a density estimation instead of patient optimization. So um, let's move on and um, address in practice these, these four points. So the first idea would be, um, so the first idea to go forward is to regress the effective likelihood. So based on the set of training points in the language of machine learning. So we have these rate points for which we have simulations here. And we want to learn the true target function, the dashed line. So what we are doing in the language of machine learning is to do a regression. So essentially we want a prediction and we want the corresponding uh, uncertainty. So this will address points one and two. We keep all the values theta high and di. So the theta are the parameters, the di are the uh, uh, distances. We're going to keep all of them as the input to our regressor. And uh, this regressor is going to model the conditional distribution of the distances given this training set. So there are uh, actually quite a few possible choices for a, for a regressor in the statistical literature. One simple example has just been mentioned in the previous talks, it's uh, Gaussian process regression, sometimes known also as uh, Krigging, I believe mostly in the geophysics literature. So why Gaussian process regression? So especially why is it a good choice in particular for ABC? Well, uh, there are um, a few reasons for that actually. So one, it's a general purpose regressor, regressor so it will be able to take into account the various uh, potential uh, shapes for the effective likelihood. 
uh, without too much uh, trouble, so potentially um, uh, able to reproduce the variety of complex and nonlinear features that we would find in, in likelihood functions. Uh, second, reason, second reason is that um, readily with the prediction it provides the uncertainty for the regression, which I'm going to use in the, in the future. Uh, in, the, in the coming slides. And third reason is that it, it not only interpolates between points, but it uh, can also extrapolate and also give a prediction and an uncertainty in regions for we, in which we have not run uh, any simulations uh, at all. So, all right, let's, let's show the, the equations for that, for Gaussian process regression. So since it's called Gaussian process, the underlying idea is to um, assume that um, the Gaussian, the data um, are, um, uh, not that the data are Gaussian distributed, but that the training data follow a Gaussian probability distribution here. So X is the set of um, parameters and F is the set of distances. So for which we write down this Gaussian probability distribution here. So it involves a kernel, this K matrix here. Uh, they are, so this is something which is, which is actually uh, very well documented in the statistical literature. Uh, a fairly simple and reasonable choice for ABC is to stick to uh, what's known here. Uh, so this is a squared exponential here, which, um, uh, for which we can, uh, from which we can model the correlation between different points. So this constant here is going to quantify how much points influence each, each other, um, uh, given their distance. Uh, so that's known as the RBF kernel for radial basis function. Uh, we, we add to that uh, Gaussian noise because all of our points here will have some noise with respect to the underlying function. And the constant here in front, we quantify essentially the, um, um, how strong these effects are uh, one to another. So how much correlation we have between points versus how much uh, noise there is in each individual point. So based on this assumption, now the prediction and the predicted uncertainty for the points come from assuming that when we add one point to this training set here, uh, then the joint probability of the training set and of the new point will follow itself a Gaussian distribution and will derive the mean and the uncertainty of the prediction uh, using essentially the same algebra as for a Wiener filter. So these are the stranded mean and covariance of conditionals of Gaussian PDFs. So based on, um, all right, just one more point. So we have three additional hyperparameters here, but in fact they can be uh, automatically adjusted during the regression uh, based on the likelihood um, itself and with an optimizer so that uh, we all, we, at the same time as doing uh, the optimization, we get the optimal values of these parameters. So this was for points one and two, keep all the values in the training set and model the distances. Uh, now we need a procedure for point three and four, so let me just remind you that point three was using Bayes' theorem to update the proposal of new point, and point four was to be able to prioritize some regions in parameter space. So now let's see, so uh, with Bolfi, with this new algorithm, so uh, samples will be obtained from sampling from an adaptively constructed proposal distribution, not only uh, the prior, but a proposal distribution which you will use the regressed effective likelihood. And point four is that uh, we do not aim at equal accuracy uh, for regions in parameter space, uh, but we write down an acquisition function and the acquisition function uh, will try to find a compromise between two effects that we want, that we have essentially in exploring parameter space. So we have uh, exploration, we try to find uh, new high likelihood regions. And the second effect is exploitation. So we want to give priority to regions where um, we already know that the effective likelihood is high essentially. So that the distance to the observed data is um, already known to be small. So based on these two effects, exploration, exploitation, the acquisition function will quantify the two. So the, the acquisition function will allow you to go from the model to the data. And now we need to close the loop, so essentially to go from the data to the model, and this will be uh, just through Bayes' theorem. And Bayesian optimization, so which is the general framework for decision making under uncertainty, uh, can be used to, to close this loop here. So can have a look at a simple one-dimensional example at what data acquisition looks like. So this is essentially the picture I was showing before, some training sets, the regression, the Gaussian process regression with a prediction and a credible regions, uh, the credible region. Based on that, we can write down an acquisition function, so more on that later. 
and we take the optimizer of this acquisition function, so the, mini the maximizer here in this case, which tells us where to run the next simulation. So in this case here, it's doing an exploration step, trying to find a new high likelihood region here. We run the simulation and learn the value here, then here, that's, that's more exploration that we do at the beginning. <coughs> And after a few, a few more steps, what the algorithm is going to do is to run simulations always close to this peak here. And that's uh, exploitation, because this is where we know that uh, we already have uh, interesting regions. In higher dimension, so let's uh, 2D example, this looks like this, so something which I uh, borrowed from a Bayesian optimization package here. So you have here the target, we have here the target function that we are trying to learn. Uh, here the predicted mean of uh, the predicted mean, so the Gaussian process mean, the Gaussian process variance. Based on these two, we write down the acquisition function, and the cross shows uh, where to run the next simulation. And you see that it does at the beginning also, also um, exploration steps. And then when the target function is better known, and when the mean begins to look like the target function, then it's going to do an uh, exploitation step, especially close to the, this peak here. Right, so let's try this algorithm on a toy example. So the simplest example, which is actually very relevant to cosmology, is to summarize Gaussian signals with unknown mean and unknown variance. And uh, to my surprise, this example was actually not fully treated in the statistical literature uh, with, uh, with Bolfi. So I had to do it, of course. Um, so the hierarchical model for this um, for this toy example of summarizing Gaussian signals looks like this. So this is um, uh, our prior, the process to generate the prior. So the natural prior for this uh, statistical application is a Gaussian inverse gamma prior, where the variance is uh, drawn from an inverse gamma distribution, and the uh, mean is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So the reason why this is the natural prior is that because it's a conjugate prior for the Gaussian uh, likelihood here. And after having generated this, the, our data from the Gaussian likelihood, we take the empirical mean and the empirical variance in the spirit of likelihood for inference. And we try to, to match the data, thank you, based on the empirical mean and empirical variance. So essentially, if we write uh, the, um, the synthetic likelihood that we should use instead of the true Gaussian likelihood, it looks like this. When you try to match the empirical mean, then we should use a Gaussian synthetic likelihood. When we use the empirical variance, we write it should follow a gamma synthetic likelihood, which is written down in, in my paper. And uh, the sum of the two will be the full Gaussian gamma synthetic likelihood. So here, the diff three different columns are the three different um, va values for the number of data points that go into the data vector here. That, uh, so essentially, the number of simulations that we take to have take the empirical mean and empirical variance. And as you can say, as you can see, the, um, essentially the noise involved in all these data points will go down. So essentially, the idea that if we invest more computational resources, then we get a better approximation of the final posterior. So uh, when summarizing this, uh, so the final uh, inference results essentially will be will look like this. So in parameter space, so mu versus sigma, the prior is in blue. And uh, trying to get um, roughly the same number of simulations accepted with rejection sampling, I ended up with, um, uh, as what I'm using here, I ended up with uh, 350,000 simulations that go into producing this um, uh, green contour here, as compared to the analytic solution in, uh, in uh, orange. And uh, this is here now in red, the posterior that I get from Bolfi, with about uh, 200, two orders of magnitude reduction in the number of simulations that are required for inference. And also, I would argue, for a slightly better approximation of the final posterior. So that will be the, the key message, that essentially the number of simulations when we use Bayesian optimization is reduced by typically uh, two to three orders of magnitude. Right, you may not take my word here because this is just summarizing Gaussian signals, uh, the most simple statistical problem to look at. So I've tried to do something which involves really cosmology as well. And uh, one such example is to have a look at the sup at supernovae catalog. So I've had a look at the joint light curve analysis catalog. So here is um, here are these data, these supernovae data. So the um, 
the observed uh, B band magnitude as a function of redshift and the correlation matrix for the uncertainties which we find um, when asking also the, the supernova cosmologists. So uh, if we try to fit uh, cosmology with that, it's then a six parameter model, which looks like this. So essentially this, this is the model for the magnitude as a function of the luminosity distance. Here the um, modeled uh, absolute magnitude, a parameter for the time stretching of the light curves and the, uh, and the color. Uh, so that's the model for the absolute magnitude, the luminosity distance, and the Hubble factor. So we have in there two cosmological parameters, which are omega m and w, the two parameters of interest, and four nuisance parameters, which are this alpha, beta, the mb here, and the delta m. And that would be the Bayesian hierarchical model to generate this data here. So the two cosmological parameters of interest and the four nuisance parameters sampled here in this likelihood. And then again, uh, running this Borfi algorithm on this uh, supernova problem gives uh, well the following results here. So trying to get the same number of uh, um, um, accepted simulations in rejection sampling as used in Borfi gives this uh, very broad posterior here, unbiased, but um, but still um, much broader than the result that we get from direct Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. Whereas with uh, Borfi we get. Uh, an almost, uh, I would argue, almost perfect posterior reconstruction. And this is again for about two orders of magnitude um, um, less simulations, uh, fewer simulations than, than with likelihood for rejection sampling. Also here the MCMC run uh, involved about uh, six uh, million data evaluations to get precisely the three sigma contour. So that's also about three orders of magnitude reduction with respect to the exact uh, statistical treatment. So one last ingredient that I didn't really talk about is what exactly we need for the acquisition function. Uh, so in the standard Bayesian optimization literature, we find a few standard optimization functions. Uh, but we should keep in mind that the goal for Bayesian optimization is usually to find the optimum, or usually assume unique, of a function. So the typical uh, acquisition function to do that is called the expected improvement. So, which is, um, which looks like, uh, in equation looks like this. So it, it really um, implements the trade-off between exploration here and exploitation here. So large uncertainty will mean that these regions are favored and will be explored. And here it involves the improvement uh, in finding the optimum. So this is the exploitation part. So if I plot it in uh, the, ex the expected improvement on my supernova example, so you have in dashed line here the posterior that we're trying to get, and this is what the expected improvement looks like with the next uh, iteration of the optimizer as the cross. So there are various drawbacks of using this expected improvement uh, when doing ABC. So the first thing is that it doesn't take into account any prior information because it's just based on the values of the effective likelihood here. Also, it's a local evaluation rule. So these uh, standard optimizers are local evaluation rules, uh, which means uh, that they do not know a lot of what happens uh, elsewhere in parameter space. And the, th and the last thing is that usually this, uh, these algorithms, since they just try to find the optimum, will usually be too greedy. So essentially, uh, once they have found uh, something which they believe is the optimum, which may or may not be the only optimum of the likelihood, actually they will tend to focus all the simulation effort very close to this peak and will poorly sample the tails of the posterior. So this is all because these are standard uh, acquisition functions for Bayesian optimization. But in fact, what we are trying to do with Borfi is uh, approximate Bayesian computation. So we can go back to the equations and ask, OK, what would be the optimal acquisition function to do approximate Bayesian computation? So the underlying question then is, uh, what are we actually trying to do in approximate Bayesian computation? And that is, we are trying to minimize the expected uncertainty in the estimate of the approximate posterior over the future evaluation of the simulator. So this uh, uncertainty in the estimate of the approximate posterior is due to the limited number of simulations that we have. And this is really what we are trying to reduce and to minimize um, as a function of the future evaluation of the, um, of the simulator. So if we write down this actual, uh, this actual goal and write a utility function for that, we can derive the shape of the utility function for Gaussian processes. 
and this is this will be then be the optimal acquisition function to do ABC, and it is called the expected integrated variance. It has been called the expected integrated variance in the statistical literature. And uh, so for Gaussian processes, it looks like this. So you have an integral over parameter space first, so theta star being the function at which we evaluate the acquisition function, and it involves an integral in parameter space. There's the prior here, which is, uh, which is involved, uh, an exploitation term. This is here the mean of the Gaussian process. So this will favor um, high likelihood um, uh, regions and we have an exploration term as well but which involves as well not only the uh, estimate of the Gaussian process the estimated uncertainty at one point but the covariance between two points within the Gaussian process regression so it will also um, have this trade-off between uh, exploit explore exploitation and exploration but has advantages with respect to standard Bayesian optimization functions so uh, first it does take into account the prior here it's a non-local process, so that means that indeed it's going to be more expensive than just evaluating the expected improvement, for example, but it will also be much more informative. And indeed, if you compare these two uh, pictures that I was showing here and here, it has a much higher degree of structure. So it's, it's much better informed uh, about what happens. So in particular, it, it knows here that it has sampled roughly the three sigma contour, so it's not going to sample much more uh, around these values here. So here it's suggesting an, explore, an exploitation step and to run a simulation um, in the one sigma contour. So that's for the second point. Uh, also third point is that the exploration of the posterior and the tails will be uh, now much more favored with respect to standard acquisition functions when it's necessary. So essentially when we know, when we have sampled already well the one sigma contour, then we are going to sample the two sigma contour, et cetera, et cetera. And last point, which is uh, interesting, is actually that um, the um, gradient of that can be written down analytically. So this, this analytic gradient can be given directly to the optimizer, and it will make the, the process, in fact, not only that expensive to, to evaluate between two running two different simulations, which is a good feature because we still want the, uh, well, running the simulation to be the bottleneck of the entire procedure computationally. Right, so I guess I'm coming close to my uh, conclusions and summary. So uh, I've been talking about um, inference with generative cosmological models. Thank you. That should be more than enough. Uh, so one first approach, which I just mentioned at the beginning, is to do uh, an exact statistical inference, in particular through Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and to uh, approximate the, the physical model. So likelihood-based method for principal analysis of galaxy surveys, uh, Hamilton and Monte Carlo, Borg. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear much more um, this week about, about this, this approach, in particular from Jens Jaschuk, E.M. Lavo, probably possibly among others. But in fact, inference with generative cosmological models is a problem that we can take from the other side, which is approximate statistical inference, but with an exact or at least an arbitrary uh, physical model. So uh, that's a likelihood-free method for which uh, for models uh, where the likelihood is not tractable, but for which simulated from the data is possible. So based on the combina uh, combination of regression of the distance and Bayesian optimization, so both here go them. Uh, the outcome is that the number of required simulations is reduced typically by two to three orders of magnitude, in all cases by several orders of magnitude. The optimal acquisition rule for approximate Bayesian computation can in fact be derived. It's called the expected integrated variance. And I'm hoping that in the future, in the near future, the approach will allow to uh, ask more targeted questions, so targeted in terms of the number of parameters, uh, to cosmological data, but will allow to, in, uh, to have much more uh, involved uh, physical modeling, in particular all the relevant um, simulation and uh, observational effects. Thank you very much.